The ideas and information explored in this webinar are featured in A Teacher's Survival Guide, Gifted Education, A First-Year Teacher's Introduction to Gifted Learners, available from proofrock.com. Our featured panelists today are the book's authors. Dr. Julia Link-Roberts is the Executive Director of the Center for Gifted Studies and Mahurin Professor of Gifted Studies at Western Kentucky University. Julia Roberts Bogus is an award-winning gifted resource teacher and currently the librarian at Perry Creek Elementary School. So let me let me start this this the first question because maybe a lot of the folks who are attending are first year teachers. Um, just and or, or, but it, actually, I think this book is great for people who are not. This is a great primer for just gifted education generally, you know. But for the both of you, just, what does a teacher new to gifted education really need to know to get started right off the bat? Well, our book starts with three chapters that I think are just at most important. And I'm going to read what the titles are. Uh, let's start at the very beginning. Who are gifted children? Two, find out what to do first. How about that? And then three, building broad-based support for gifted education. I think you've got to start at the very beginning and you've got to know what you are expected to do and uh, then get started one step at a time. So one of the things when I started teaching gifted kids that surprised me, and I, I wondered if you guys could talk a little bit about it. It was just one of the first thing you notice when you walk in the door with gifted kids is what the, the variability among kids in that classroom. In fact, I would contend that the variability of those kids that are you know gifted are uh, is as wide as they are in any other segment of the population. Did you find that to be true as as teachers and and is that is that true that backed up in the literature that there's just a variability of abilities and skill sets and even interest among those kids? There, I, I actually once had uh, the pleasure of speaking with someone who kept saying, "Oh, if the child is very neat, well, they're not gifted." Or, and I'm like, "Well, you you can't really black uh, put things in yes or no categories because every child, gifted or not, is is just different than the next child and." You will have very old souls that get along much better with adults in your gifted class. And then you'll have some younger kids who just are very adept at, you know, let's say math and that they want to sit and talk about math all day with kids on that note. So there's no cookie cutter form. And it's not like you can do a checklist of, yep, these are my gifted kids because there are, in fact, it's so funny. I used to have, um, Teachers come up and go, I had no idea that child was gifted. They just sit and stare off in my class. And so I was kind of like, oh, well, let's see what we can do to remedy that so that he's focused and enjoying his time in your class. Yeah, I think I feel like I I, I talk a lot to this topic when I talk about equity issues. And, and one of the problems that we have is that people have a notion of what a gifted kid is. Uh, and they, and it varies from one person to the next, but that, that notion is pretty hard to, uh, to get over. And, and, and sometimes I, I have conversations that, that I realize that we're still dealing with notions of what is a gifted child where you, you know, somebody will say, uh, boy, he's, he performs or she performs at the top levels, 99th percentile. They, uh, they're, they're super achievers. They're doing fantastic in school, but you know, they're not gifted. <laughs> and I think, well, I, I think performance is kind of part of that equation, you know, mm -hmm. uh, is, is it, do you, do you all have a thought about that? Absolutely. Um, I remember, and, and this, kind of skews off of that a bit, someone saying to me that the loudest student in the class and the quietest student in the class may well be gifted and not noticed as gifted because of those behaviors. And so those are different kinds of performances, but nonetheless, we've got to break through those and, and look at what the child is thinking about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That makes a, a lot of sense. Let me let me do this screen share real quickly because Julie, you brought up the uh, the table of contents for the book, and I, I want to mention that what first of all what a comprehensive potpourri of of topics. And I I'm scrolling so you guys can't read them, but you can go to the Proof Rock Press website and you know see the table of contents, see what topics are are being discussed. But Julie, you mentioned these first three chapters and uh, the, find out what you do first. Can you talk to me a little bit about what you guys meant by that? What 
what do you do first? Well, if you've been hired in a district, it's pretty important for someone to uh, converse with you about what they expect you to do first. Because if you are going to get started, you need to do it uh, meeting the expectations of the person who hired you. And it's pretty important to find out what does your state say about gifted ed? What what are the regulations in your state? I'm, and I'm talking about the real basic stuff that you must know in order to get started. That's right, because every state has different regulations for that sort of thing. And you know, certainly one of the things that we see in gifted ed that in, uh, that's troublesome sometimes, is, well, it is troublesome, is that there there may be requirements to identify, but no requirements to serve the kids with services, you know, and, and so you've got this, this very complex mix of things that, and certainly, you know, if you've got a district with a very strong gifted program, there's going to be different expectations on the part of a new teacher than if you're just kind of that, that teacher that the principal has, you know, relegated over <laughs> to this, this, this crowd of kids. And that's unfortunate. I mean, in gifted ed, Special ed has the the fortunate piece of being federally funded, and gifted ed is really entirely related to local control and and, and then state control. Um, on a more positive note, Julie, let me ask you: you you've been in the classroom for many years, and and thinking about one of the things that I I I, I mentioned what a teacher would expect when they walk into a gifted classroom, but what what do the students want from a teacher who's new to gifted education? Well, I. I'm lucky enough to say that I have a kiddo who uh, falls under the gifted services umbrella, and she had one of the absolute most outstanding um, gifted teachers who was an advocate for her. If there were social issues or academic issues, she knew that she could go to Miss Pittman and that Miss Pittman would listen to her and value her opinions on matters and really be able to advocate for her. And as a parent, it was nice for me to say, you know, she's had the same spelling list for ages or something like that, or she's not being pre-tested. And instead of me seeming like the nosy, pushy parent, Mrs. Pittman was able to go in and be like, hey, just double checking to make sure that we're doing dot, dot, dot. And so they're not only an advocate for the student, but they're also an advocate for the parent because that makes the relationship between the teacher and the parent and the teacher and the child um, an easier relationship because it's not always a corrective one. It can happen more naturally. Yeah, I, 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 100%. And I, I, I'm glad you mentioned this advocacy piece, um, partially because it's a role of a teacher, right, to, to advocate for you know the gifted kids. Uh, but also I think that that may create a special relationship sometimes with the parents as well, because the parents are advocates too. Can maybe visit a little bit about the teacher's role as an advocate for gifted kids. In in what sense? Um, in the classroom, I think it's very important that they are not just seen as doing fun projects with the kids or an extension off of something that there is some meat and substance to what they're doing with the kids and that if a child is struggling um, with social issues within the classroom, that they are naturally able to guide and make it so that it's um, an easier process to not fix, but to kind of analyze and help remedy some of those issues. It's also really important that um, they form kind of a friendship um, or a kinship um, with, the, and when I was a gifted resource teacher, that was the relationship that I enjoyed the most was when we'd be sitting there talking about things and a humorous, well, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, and I had a student in my class who had a very famous country music singer uh, as a parent, and this kiddo wanted to be a famous comedian. And so we were talking about what steps would you have to do to get to where you could achieve your goal? And, you know, every kid has their own goal. And he goes, well, I really want to go get on the Tonight Show, you know, and meet Jay Leno. And I'm like, I, I do think that that is an actual possibility for you in a way that it's not for other people because <laughs> your, your dad's on that show every now and then. So, it, you know, just in knowing the personal lives of the kids and not ever making it feel like it's a big deal 
that you're there to advocate for them, but that it's a natural, a, a natural way of wanting to support them, that it just comes naturally because um, just having that kid have that extra support that other child, especially in high schools, one of the big things um, in our high schools in Williamson County is they're the advocates for the kids to make sure that they're getting streamlined into the classes that they need. And the role does change the older the child gets, but it's as crucial a role, if not possibly more crucial, to help them make uh, collegiate choices and to be on the right path to steer through that. And um, you, you can never have too many people rooting for you in your corner. Yeah, I absolutely. Agree, agree with you. I think that another way that a teacher advocates for students is as we provide appropriate instruction for them in a classroom. And that making sure, I think what Julie means by meaty is, is more complex. It's, it's, it's something worthy of thinking about. And uh, it's a meaningful learning experience. And I think we must advocate because too many uh, teachers are getting the message from principals uh, that it's okay to get everyone up to grade level. And that's no goal at all for a child who is there or beyond. And I think that's crucial, especially during the pandemic um, time that we have been in where every child's learning has been flipped upside down in one way or the other. One of the most dangerous things I hear people say is, oh, don't worry about the gifted kids, they'll be fine. And I don't believe that's true. They'll be fine, but does anybody ever say, I want to have food that is fine. I want to go to you know a fancy place, but I just want it to be fine. No, you wanna have the absolute best of the best. And you want each kid, if this is where you want everybody to be, there are some kids that are gonna be up here and we need to have the teachers that are advocating for them to get past that point that fine isn't okay for everybody. Yes. I, you know, I've often thought that like, unfortunately, one of the ways that we are, are uh, we're closing the excellence gap is just eliminating a gifted program, <laughs> but you know, you can bring oh, yeah. the top down and then suddenly you've got less of a gap, you know, and uh, uh, that. Or no gap very, at all. Or no yeah. gap at all. That's right, Julia. And uh, Joel, Julia, one, yeah. so sorry, yeah. one more way that the, gifted teacher can be an advocate for the student is by making them not seem so scary to the teachers. Um, and I, I don't mean that to sound so dramatic, but a lot of, I've encountered teachers who are very fearful of having a gifted child in their class because they think that it's going to disrupt things or that they're going to have to teach an entirely different way. And I think demystifying that and making it so that they're seen as a positive and not a you know, a, a negative within the classroom is is very wonderful. And also to make sure that the kid, because unfortunately one thing that tends to happen is, oh, well, they can tutor so-and-so, you know, and, and that will be the way that they'll get, well, that doesn't work. And, you know, it it's helpful, but it isn't helpful to the kid that already knows the material and needs to be moving on. Yes, that's absolutely true. And, and I, um, I agree with you about that. I, I think that there was this, you know, and Julia, you would remember this. I can't remember it entirely. So don't no, no one out there at the webinar quote me, but there was some, Sally Reese did a, a study at one point and I'm going to botch this, but it was something like this, that uh, of the gifted kids uh, coming into a fourth grade classroom, they already knew 80% of what was going to be taught that year in the, in the classroom. And uh, you know, the, 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 knowing that and then having those kids just tutor other kids on the content that they already know isn't going to accelerate anything. And and uh, so, yeah, that what you're saying makes a lot of sense, Julie. Julia, you're you're involved with a lot of teacher education uh, and, and teachers out in the field. When you see teachers going out there for the first time as a teacher of, of gifted, what do you see as the, the, the most common barriers uh, that that they that they experience and, and what do they need to avoid? Well, I think one of the things that provides a huge challenge is teachers seeing that they don't have to do anything for the gifted children, that the gifted resource teacher takes care of all of that. And of course, we know that being in a classroom, it's the learning every day, all day in school that matters. I think another barrier that's out there 
is the gifted teacher fitting into a um, a school environment. So many times, at least around here, you may have two or three schools. And so if as a gifted resource teacher, you're one place on Monday and Tuesday, another on Wednesday and Thursday, and another on Friday, because it's a smaller school, it's really hard to be a part of that many school environments. So, uh, kind of building relationships with teachers. And uh, once again, finding out what does each principal expect of you because it could be very different. Uh, you know, and, and what you're talking to is really a changing role of, of, of gifted teachers frequently. I remember, and Stephanie can vouch for this, we were in an acquisition meeting when when Emily Mofield had pitched the idea of her book, Collaboration, Co-Teaching and Coaching in Gifted Education. And I, I remember thinking, oh, no, nobody, nobody's doing that. And I was so wrong. I mean, I just, I, I, the role of the, the gifted teacher now can be a push-in model where they're coming into the classroom periodically. They're moving from one school to the next. I mean, the, the, the model that they're using for, for gifted teachers now can change uh, from, from one district to the next. And, Absolutely. Yeah. And even yeah. in one district from year to year, because when I was a gifted resource teacher in Williamson County, I had four schools that were far, far, you know, across the county. And only one of the buildings did I actually have a room. Other ones I was in conference rooms or different places like that. And now we have it to where they predominantly have one gifted teacher per elementary school, which is a big benefit. Yes, absolutely. Th th thanks for sharing that piece. Uh, Julia, let me, let me, well, actually, Julie and Julia, let me, let me, I only focus this on Julia because she has written a book on differentiation strategies as well as the, the, uh, the materials that are in this book. When helping teachers plan for differentiation, where does a new teacher start? I think the hardest selling point for that, <laughs> strange as it is, is pre-assessment because if you don't plan and then pre-assess who already knows it or can do it, um, it it's meaningless differentiation. I encounter with my graduate students lots of information about pre-assessment, but they find that lots of teachers don't use what they pre-assess they do it because they're required to do it. So if I could um, get the world of teaching to do any one thing, it would be to pre-assess after you've planned and then use the pre-assessment information to plan learning experiences that will challenge all of the students. But you don't probably do that with one lesson plan. It can be on the same topic, the same concept, but you do a few different things with it in order to see that all students are working at a level at which they're ready to learn. And that's really true even in a class of gifted students. It reminds me, Mom, of when we had done a workshop on differentiation, oh, probably a decade ago. And we were taught, it was with my school faculty, and we were talking with them about how to start differentiating. And I, it's kind of can be daunting if you look at it and you think I've got to differentiate everything. We have wonderful teams within schools now. And those teams are really more collaborative um, than I think they ever have been. And if you have a teammate who really enjoys one subject over another, let them run with one differentiating one lesson and you run with one. And that way you get twice as much differentiation in the same amount of time. And it's because it's it's very overwhelming. It's like, uh, here, memorize the Bible. And you're like, I, I can't do that. That's too overwhelming. But piece by piece, you can handle it. That makes that makes perfect sense. Let me mention, since we're talking about differentiation, I'll do my publisher role and, and share Julia's uh, uh, strategies for differentiating instruction, best practices in the classroom. Uh, that's available from Proof Rock Press. Uh, it's a little sales pitch there, uh, and it's a it's a wonderful book on the topic of differentiation. 
let me let me kind of move into a little bit of some stuff that I was thinking. Hmm, I think people, if you're new to g- gifted, you might need to know um, or might come in with some of those preconceived notions of what a gifted child is. What do you guys, both of you, what do you think are some of the biggest myths and misconceptions about gifted learners? Oh, the scary thing with that is they are they're the same as they were ten years ago and twenty years ago. They're simply new people who are aren't doing this and. We have to keep educating folks. Um, if I'm thinking of one that's pretty damaging is the fact that uh, acceleration um, hurts gifted kids. Well, the fact is we have 20 plus types of acceleration um, when matched to the student and his or her readiness to learn all of them, the research says work very well, good results, and no harm to children. Julie, what's one you think of? Well, I think a misconception is that, oh, it's hard to pick, it's hard to pick one. (laughs) There are so many. Um, Really that, again, I hate to mention it again, but they'll be fine. If you don't modify anything, that they'll be fine. Because I do find that to be the scariest one. And I had a superintendent in another district that started off at a parent meeting um, with gifted kids, uh, gifted kids, parents, and actually said, oh, well, I'm not really worried about the gifted kids. They'll be fine. That was the absolute wrong thing to say to that crew of people. And they ended up having to, you know, bring in a specialist to, you know, help out with all of that. And um, it's getting everybody to understand that it's okay to advocate for a gifted kid, just like it's okay to advocate for a child who is struggling. Um, They both have needs that need to be met within the regular education environment. Julie, my answer to they'll be fine, well, perhaps they will be fine, but would you say to a young athletic boy or girl that don't worry about them, skip the coaches, they're athletic, so they'll be, be fine. Well, we wouldn't begin to do that. We would get coaches who who work with them, and we need to be doing that to make sure that the potential of our gifted children are also developed. Absolutely. Yeah, I, 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 that's a great analogy, uh, too, because I, I, I have, over the years... Now I'm I'm sure that there are kids who are you know profoundly gifted or or so, whatnot that that really do need some very focused services. But I suspect m- many gifted kids would be fine. But if if that's if that's our highest expectation for our our, our brightest and highest performers is that like we just well we're going to look for that mediocre thing. <laughs> you know, I think we we as it we need to rethink that. I I suppose. Um, I was thinking about some uh, characteristics of of gifted kids that teachers might have to deal with in the classroom. And one of those is this idea of asynchronous development uh, and how that impacts the educational experience of both the kid and the teacher. Maybe you guys could talk a little bit about that topic and what the teacher is going to see as a result of that. Well, let's start out thinking about a child who is just very good at mathematics. I was talking about a child with a parent this weekend, the little girl's five, and she's multiplying and dividing. Now, in a kindergarten class, that's unusual. It's unusual that that opportunity would have been presented for the child. But the, this little girl is very much a five-year-old most of the time. But when it comes to learning in math, She needs to be learning at a higher level than that. And that is asynchronous development. And if we're not careful, we see the adult thinking a child can do. And yet the behaviors that are far more age related. And uh, it's a challenge. It is. Uh, And I think on that same note that if you have a child that is very well read and is reading at a high school level in second or third grade, and then they have a disagreement with the friend or something and the teacher witnesses it, sometimes people tend to hold the 
gift a child to a different standard of, oh, she shouldn't have gotten upset by that. But you have to remember, she's just a second grader. She may be reading these very complicated texts, but she still has the childlike mind of a, a child who gets upset and gets flustered in the same way that all kids do. And it doesn't need to be discounted or seen that they need to move past it faster than any other kid just because. And so what we need to do is recognize the advanced levels and expect grade level. That, absolutely. And I, and I was thinking that if you were someone who had the emotional, um, the emotional um, um, fortitude or, or health of a third grader, but had the intellectual ability of a sixth grader, that may actually create more frustration for you uh, in, in school. And, and that gets me to a topic that I, I'm, I, I never touch on because uh, I, I have friends who are psychometricians who uh, I, I go to conferences and the topic of overexcitabilities come up and, and there's like, well, there's the, the comment is, well, there's no research to support that there are overexcitabilities. And, and, and I keep thinking in the back of my mind, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And when, when I published a book on overexcitabilities, it is one of our best-selling titles because parents know it's a thing. They they're dealing with that with with their kids. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna make the assertion that at least for some kids, overexcitability is is something that, that they'll be contending with, and and a teacher might. Can can you guys address that a little bit for, for just just to be nice to me about it? <laughs> well, I think I think where we see that is with intensities. And whether those are physical intensities, emotional intensities, um, any of the, the possibilities that are there with the overexcitabilities, we just need to be able to recognize those behaviors and accept them for what they are. That makes a lot of sense. A lot of sense. Finally, one one last one before we, uh, I'll basically I'll wrap this up for my piece, and I'll, I'll also do a little promo for the book, and then uh, and then I'll turn it over to Stephanie for the Q and A. So let me encourage everyone uh, right now. If you have some questions, go to the Q and A, post the Q and A. I mentioned this in the beginning. We're not monitoring the chat. That is more for just social inter interaction with you guys, but. But the Q&A is where Stephanie gets those questions, and I sure would appreciate you guys participating in that and uploading some of the questions that you're most pressing that you'd like to have addressed. Uh, Ju Julian and Julie, perfectionism is something we see with gifted kids. Um, why? I remember the first book that I published on perfectionism, I brought it to my dad and I gave it to him and he looked at the title. And he said, why is this a problem? <laughs> <laughs> He was an old army general, so yeah, he wanted it to be perfect. Perfect, you know. Uh, why? Why is perfect, perfectionism a bit challenging? And and what what is a teacher? How what is a teacher going to see when they see a kid that exhibits that behavior? Well, that's kind of an interesting topic to bring up because it highlights something about our book. We have experts in all areas of gifted ed who have written one and two page pieces in the book. Perfectionism is one of those pieces. And uh, so if you want to learn a little bit about a topic about gifted kids, our book is probably a really good place to get a, a good start. Perfectionism is um, certainly not found among all gifted students. I think they tend to be on the extremes with characteristics and you're either really perfectionistic or someplace along the line, but gifted kids could also be incredibly unorganized. So you see the range of behaviors. Perfectionism is no problem at all unless it becomes something that uh, gets in the way of performing. And if it gets in the way of performing, then it is a problem for us. Um, I think the research would tell us now that gifted students are no more perfectionistic than, than the whole range of students, but I've read different things on that particular topic, and we do know there are gifted kids who are perfectionists. And in all honesty, um, I'm kind of with your dad. They're, they're 
certainly ways that we want students to give their very best. Those people who have developed expertise are, spe- are perfectionist about that. It's when you are perfectionistic about all aspects of your life that you probably are dealing with something that doesn't work very well. Well, when it puts a roadblock up, because a lot of times um, in dealing with gifted kids, when they say, oh, I'm not guaranteed to be good at that or the best at it. And if I don't try, I can't fail. So that puts up the roadblock that is not helpful to the kiddo in moving forward. Um, But that's why I love doing bibliotherapy with kids who are perfectionists and, you know, reading books with them on understanding. So it doesn't hit them in the face of what you're talking with them about. But through the literature, you're they're realizing that here's a girl who never made mistakes And everybody is shocked when she does make a mistake, but her life keeps going on and things are good afterwards. And it's that happy accident that can come from mistakes too. One of the things I tell kids, they get very frustrated sometimes when they're doing art or something in library and they'll come up and I say, I need, I need a new paper. I messed up. And I said, ah, it, your illustration just went in a direction that you had not expected. And they kind of walk back to their seat and sit down and keep going. And it's just that if you accept a stumbling block as a failure, perfectionism is an end road. But if you realize that you can recover from it and move forward, that's what's helpful to kiddos. No, yeah, that makes sense. I feel like that probably ties in a little bit too to this idea. That I, I saw this with some some kids. This is true of a lot of kids, but it's, it was particularly true in, in the gifted uh, program. Uh, kids who were just like, just tell me what I got to do to make an A. And I'm not going to go beyond that. I'm just going to do that thing because, uh, and I don't, that's not necessarily the same thing as perfectionism, but it ties this into this idea of risk-taking and and those two things can inhibit risk-taking, whether it be perfectionism or just that sense that grades are the thing that we want to be rewarded by. Uh, Let let me take a moment. And again, before I turn it over to Stephanie for the Q and A, I'm going to, I wanted to share this, um, uh, share this book cover with you guys. Uh, let me try that again. It's easy. <laughs> you send the wrong thing. <laughs> uh, let me let me encourage you guys to come to the uh, Proof Rock Press website and purchase the Teacher Survival Guide to Gifted Education. I would mention, just as a, a side note, if, if you're going to buy a copy of this book for your own use, please feel free and don't feel guilty to go to Amazon. You'll get a, a nice little discount off the, the price. And, and you, if you're a Prime member, you won't pay uh, shipping. But if you're going to buy multiple copies for, say, a book study or for your district level um, uh, to, to use this book as part of training or for uh, um, you know for a university course, even as an introduction to, uh, to these kids, uh, I would encourage you to come directly to Proofrock. And, and if you're doing a bulk order, my, my customer service folks will give you a little discount on it. We'll make it um, a, a nice deal for you guys. So um, just, you know, kind of pick where you're going to purchase it, but know that we'll help you out if, if you've got a, a bulk purchase you'd like to make. And now let me turn it back over. Stephanie, uh, uh, Stephanie McCauley is our education editor, one of our education editors here in Austin, Texas. And I'm going to turn it over to her to handle the Q&A. And thank you, everyone, for your questions. Um, Stephanie. Hi. Yeah, we have some great questions already. Uh, This first one is from Cynthia. She says, how can GT teachers go about advocating for gifted students when the administration is not fully aware of how gifted students are not being serviced in the best way? Um, She says, if I try to advocate for my students, I tend to be ignored or sidelined in favor of students who are performing below expectation. Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is when you have examples of students performing above level, make sure you have the opportunity to share that information. I think it's possible that an administrator is so worried about getting everyone up to grade level, they're not at all worried about the other kids. But let's not pass up opportunities to share good stories and to let those products be seen by decision makers at the school. Great, that's good advice. Um, 
Our second question, uh, I feel like most teachers are so overwhelmed that differentiation is too much to expect, yet students really deserve it, uh, an appropriately challenging and stimulating instruction environment. Um, considering the needs of gifted students, what setting do you think is ideal for them? There are certain kids who do best when they are getting their enrichment in a separate environment for a period of time. But I find what is most beneficial is when they are in the regular ed classroom and things are differentiated so that everybody's getting what they need. And it would be kind of the equivalent that you wouldn't take somebody who uh, is a vegetarian to Ponderosa. It's the only really meaty place I could think of um, to eat because it really wouldn't meet their needs. They would get a smattering of some, you know, vegetables or something, but it really wouldn't it's not catered to them. So it is daunting to consider differentiation for everyone, but that's where if you take it little by little and each year say, this is what I'm gonna differentiate. And, and it's more manageable when you can see it and say, these are the things I'm gonna work on this year. Then next year you have those things, pick some different things and add those on. Kind of like a Chinese menu where you just go, I'll take part of A and part of B and move on through. And if you try to do it all at once, it's horrid, but if you do it little by little, in the end, you have a wonderful, wonderful curriculum. And let me add something to that. I think differentiation means so many different things to so many people. It is important that a school decide what is differentiation in this school so that the first steps can be made, the second steps, and that the professional learning that goes along with it goes down one alley rather than in a, a scatter uh, pattern. And tiering is what will work most obviously. Everyone studies the same thing, but they have learning experiences on different levels. And I think many teachers think it's way too complex because they think it's different lesson plans for different groups. Well, it really isn't that at all. It's taking a basic lesson plan and tiering some learning experiences so everyone discusses the same topic, but they've engaged in different learning experiences during the day or the week or whatever. And I think even choice in product is also a wonderful way to differentiate for the students. Um, there's, I know everybody's done a KWL chart, um, which just often gets shelved away. But if you make that last component, how do you want to learn instead of how did you learn it? How do you want to learn that? And let the kids have some say in how they're learning and participating they'll be more invested in it because they feel that they've had a part in it and they'll be more committed to what they're doing because they're invested. Great. That's helpful. Um, another question here. Uh, what do we do for students in a school that doesn't have a strong gifted program? I think if professional learning can be about any topic that gifted or differentiation can be included as part of it. So it seems like it's in the regular system. For example, if you have professional learning on assessment, perhaps uh, that can also include pre-assessment as well as formative assessment. And, and so trying to get people talking about it, maybe even getting a few people who are interested doing a book study. Doesn't have to be everyone. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, another question here, uh, what do we do with kids who are gifted in thought, thinking and ideas, but are average in reading and writing? I think that for them, you set expectations that allow their complex thinking to shine and uh, work with them as they develop their writing abilities. 
those don't all come along at the same time. They can develop at, at on different time schedules. And actually you can, with today's technology, there are so many different things that if they are able to talk through what they're doing, but not get it down on paper, there are so many different videos and apps out there that could really help a child find their voice per se um, within that. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense because I, I know just because I have a sort of special interest in twice exceptional kids, you know, that that, you know, that's boy, that's a profile right there. Not that, that that's who we're talking about here, but but a kid who, you know, is thinking at the highest levels, but just getting that down onto paper or because of dyslexia is not not, not able to read it as quickly and has to do audio books or whatever. I mean, there, there's a there's just a lot of variability among, you know, what what is a gifted kid can 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 vary quite a bit. And I, I think understanding that and then making accommodations like like Julie talked about or, or uh, you know, allowing somebody to give the answers orally or instead of having to read a book, have different mo- ways of, uh, of absorbing that content are, are terribly important. Oh, to a parent yesterday whose son has dysgraphia, uh, loves physics, is thinking at the highest level, wanting to know if we could make accommodations in our summer programming. And of course we can Yeah, uh, we had another question here. Um, hopefully I get the meaning of this right. Uh, but what do you do when you start doubting your gifted students' abilities when they don't want to learn? Oh, and you know what, guys? I bet this comes up has come up quite a bit with the online learning piece and, mm-hmm. and all, all this. That's just been kids who just checked out who previously had been pretty good about that. Any thoughts about that? I think it's so important for the relational uh, piece to be in place to where you can one-on-one figure out with that child, hey, you know what I noticed? And I do this with kids even pre-pandemic of, I noticed that you're not enjoying what we're doing and you're not really speaking up. You're not being involved as much as you used to be. Can I help you with anything? Is there anything that you and I can work together on? And that they, once you build that relationship and there will be that level of trust to where when there is something they're uncomfortable with, or it may just not be what they're interested in, but you can, they'll feel comfortable to come to you and say, I didn't understand that. Or we did that last year and I already had that down pat to kind of figure out um, if that's why they're disconnecting. I would think another um, way to approach that would be to, as, as a parent, you know what your child's interested in. So making sure that they have opportunities in their interest area outside of school, if not inside of school. Lots of times we show what we're best in outside of school rather than inside because that's the place we can address interests. Yeah, those are helpful ideas. Um, Let's see. Uh, This next question kind of goes back to uh, how we started the webinar. Um, I was wondering uh, if there are no cookie cutter forms or characteristics to say um, these are definitely gifted children because they have all of these characteristics. Um, To what extent can we really say that there are gifted children and those who are not gifted? You know what, Julie and and Julia, maybe think about I was thinking about how you distinguish between programs and services, and maybe that's a way to 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 address that. I, I you of course can do it any way you want to. I just thought you had kind of talked about that in your book. We we have, uh, you know, for a long time, I, I thought we should not be offering the gifted program. We ought to be offering services for gifted students. A gifted program assumes that they all are are capable of being serviced with one option unless there are really multiple services within that program. And that certainly is the case. I think one of the things that I think is most important to remember about gifted children is that their needs are created by their strengths. And consequently, they don't look needy. And that leads to lots of misunderstanding of them. You know, we usually think of a need being created by an area in which you need to work 
Well, that's not true with gifted kids. Their needs are created because that's an area of strength. And that doesn't mean we should not pay attention to it. Uh, we just need to pay attention to it to build onto that strength. I don't know that we did a good job of answering that question. Well, I think it also depends state by state, because in Tennessee, we have a certain set of tests that determine whether a child gets gifted services or not. And it's drastically different in Kentucky, which is right next door. Um, so it, it's just it really state dependent on what your state has said is that. But there are I, I had one school that I worked at where. I was deemed to be doing fun stuff um, where we were doing lots of hands-on programming and getting kids involved. And with certain classes, it worked best if I moved into the regular ed classroom and team taught with the teacher so that it was really a collaborative effort to where the gifted child I was servicing got what they needed, but other children benefited from it in a way that, so I didn't have to have, at one point I was having several meetings up your child is very bright, but in Tennessee, they did not meet the requirement. And that's a heck of a hard meeting to have. Um, so we decided, uh, the principal and I got together and we decided, why don't we push in to that classroom that had a lot of parent interest? That way we were meeting not just my uh, service, my child who I'm servicing, but the other students as well. Mm, that's that's a great point. That's a great point. Um, Stephanie, maybe maybe one more question that we have time for and um, and, and, and then we'll, we'll sort of wrap up here. Yeah, sure thing. Um, this one's a comment, but you might have some ideas. Uh, this person said, I would love to see a sample book list for bibliotherapy for oh. perfectionism. Oh, I happen to have <laughs> one. Um, me, I'll text it to myself and I'll put it in the comments. Um, we just did a thing for the Kentucky Association of Gifted Ed, and um, I did it from my library. So I went over and yanked over several of my, I have my books organized by favorites in school and not the normal way that you you keep them organized, but I have that right here and I'll pop it in the comments. Oh, that's great. Thank you for doing that. That's great. And I also, I noticed there were a couple of questions. Uh, one had to do with the bibliotherapy, and Julia does not know about this, but uh, Tom Bear is going oh. to be, uh, let me let me make sure I get that book cover up. And he is Tom amazing. Is doing, now, he did not allow us to use bibliotherapy in the title. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's got it, uh, but because he didn't want to, he didn't, I, I mean, I, he didn't want to clinicalize something that can be very fun and enjoyable and, and it, the exploration of books and using that as a bibliotherapy. He just kind of wanted to move away from the, the clinical um, idea. So that, that book is coming up. And then also, I wanted to mention someone else asked what happens if you are, you're in a rural community and you, uh, you, 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 don't, you have limited folks that can serve as gifted kids. And I did want to mention and recommend Tamara Stambaugh's book, um, Serving Gifted Students in, in, in a Rural Setting. Um, I, I, now that I've promoted other people's books, let me, let me come back and um, uh, mention that uh, the, um, uh, let me, let me go back to my slides here and we'll come back to, uh, boy, I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble today with my, uh, with my slideshow. Let me, let me get that back up. And, and, and sorry, the list is not uh, formatted correctly. If going from an email to text to inputting, not the best, but, but you can, you can see it. Yeah. And we'll make sure if you watch the recording, we'll get that in, in the recording as well. So. And some are ones that I share every year with our students all grade levels, because I think it's so important um, to talk with the kiddos about accepting differences. And it's just as important for a librarian to be an advocate for gifted kids as the PE teacher or whoever in the building. And I think that that's where you get um, the, the team really built is when everybody sees themselves as an investor in that child's education. And uh, to really kind of address, if there's an issue with a child with a, a special need, they would talk about it with the class and maybe not in such a formal setting, but in a way that everybody understands. We need every teacher to be a talent scout. Absolutely, Julia, That that's absolutely true. 
Let me also mention that Julia and Julie have been kind enough to uh, allow you guys to reach out if you have any any other questions, uh, and they're they're more than happy to uh, answer questions for you. If you would take a screenshot of that, uh, I'm going to have to pull it down in just a sec. But I did I wanted you guys to have that contact information uh, there as well. Do you know and that makes me giggle? We did that picture back when my daughter was oh three, and we'd taken her for her. Uh, no, she was one and a half. We'd taken her for her pictures and we're like, let's just jump in and do a picture for the book really quick. And when the book picture came out, Claire was very disturbed that her picture was not in there because we have a picture of the three of us together. She's like, where am I? <laughs> <laughs> And as a reminder, everybody, we've been talking about the Teacher's Survival Guide to Gifted Education, a first-year teacher's introduction to gifted learners. And I would recommend you either go to Amazon, your book, local bookseller, or proofrock.com and, and pick up a copy. So now it's my turn to thank, well, first, Stephanie, thank you for handling the Q&A for everybody. And then th thank you, Julia Roberts and, and, and Julia B B Bogus. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today and talking about this great book. And, and I, I know everybody had such a good time. And I want to thank the audience. Uh, thanks, everybody, for attending and uh, putting up with me for almost an hour. So uh, thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.